that. So maybe we can just really quickly, if people are just tuning in who have never heard of this before, yeah, maybe yeah. we just point out very quickly that there's essentially two kinds of light. I mean, I'm just going to put them in two bins yeah, right yeah, yeah, now, fine. just so it's simple, mm-hmm. right? If you take, mm-hmm. say, uh, a fluorescent light bulb and you, you know, take the back of a CD and just split it, you can just diffract it. You'll get mm-hmm. these nice little lines that appear. Now, if you mm-hmm. go to a light bulb, which is actually a heated filament, and you do mm-hmm. the same thing, you get this beautiful rainbow, right? Yes. And yep, the sun right is quite obviously one of the most perfect examples of this beautiful rainbow that we can imagine. And mm-hmm. of course, there are these little lines laid over top of it, which we attribute to the atmosphere, the corona of the sun. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. fundamentally, the assertion that the sun is a gaseous plasma violates all empirical evidence that we've obtained on Earth in any laboratory ever, and no one has been able to manage this kind of beautiful, what we call a black body spectrum, this continual rainbow on Earth in a laboratory with anything like a gas. And so, the way it, I, I want to add... Okay. The, the, the way that I deal with this with my students, because I also lecture in, in astronomy at a university here, and it's very mm-hmm. tricky, but if you think about an atom... It really only has a few ways that it can vibrate. And we know light is essentially a vibratory process. There's only a few degrees of freedom. And so the result of that is that it has very limited frequencies of light that it emits. But in a body like this filament in these uh, solid condensed matter light bulbs, you have Mm -hmm. all of these overtones of vibration that are electronically possible all of a sudden. Uh, Honestly, Mm -hmm. you have an infinite division. You can can vibrate a a table in an infinite number of ways, essentially, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, as a result of that, there's a mechanism, there's a reason that a condensed matter heated body gives off a continuous spectrum, and there's a reason that a gas gives off line spectra. And when we look at the sun, it's quite obvious what we're seeing. Yeah, 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 yeah. You you explained it perfectly. Yeah, that's uh, nothing to add. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, definitely. And I've because you began the explanation with a f- with the fluorescent light versus the incandescent light, and you hadn't yet said that the difference lay in gaseous versus condensed matter. But you got there. It's at the it's at the heart of things. Um, I was hoping maybe we could go through some of these yeah. r- really yeah. important just, points. Just that I mean that that's the key sentence. He said in his YouTube lecture, and he said, I'm going to argue that the sun is condensed matter. And I said, what? (laughs) It's kind of a cold shiver that took me, but it was also something that like, click, okay, yeah. Did you really reflect on the the fact that a gas gas cannot emit a black body spectrum? Yeah, And, uh, and so, I mean, that that very sentence uh, immediately attracted my interest the way you already explained here and um yeah i realized that all these trials to fix that model and what what came afterwards were just patches we're not really good science in the sense yeah well it's kind of it is kind of embarrassing when you realize it for the first time because it's just this thing that's been hanging there in plain sight your whole life and you just kind mm-hmm. of took it you know, and you're like, yeah, okay. But when you really start to, th- yeah, the first time you realize it's really, it's horrible because we bring it up to astrophysicists on this show all the time and mm-hmm. you feel kind of bad about it, right? Because you mm-hmm. you realize that it's a terrible thing to to have that recognition of, especially in a public space. And mm-hmm. I don't know, I, I think that we have to forget, forgive ourselves a little bit when it comes to these <laughs> things. Yeah, I mean, it's really a lecture for everyone personally how much of what you believe is your knowledge how much of it is at the very end parroting <laughs> how much that's a beautiful phrase if you allow me the deviation of the of the sociologist of science harry collins who says uh in one of his books he says even you're an expert even you a very uh distinguished uh scientist in your field keep in mind 95 of percent of the knowledge you believe is still parroting in the sense that you believe from others uh, it's very and and you have to do this because otherwise you you're ending up um verifying trivial things and banalities and, and waste your scientific life uh in another way you know i mean you can't put into question everything that's the problem 
Yeah, and there's no time for that, right? When in the yeah. educational process, especially in grad school, you're just working so hard on some project. It's not like you have time to review the fundamental assumptions, and it I can happen it, to anybody, right? I think that it's worse than that. Is that from my experience in grad school, it was that reviewing the fundamental assumptions was something that you actually were actively discouraged from doing because it creates too many complications. <laughs> where, you know, I we were I did microbiology and you work inside of a model system. And when you start to question, hey, is the model system really representative of the things that we're trying to say on a larger biological mm-hmm. scale? Mm-hmm. In mm-hmm. some cases, yes. In some cases, no. But it's definitely a question that you're discouraged from really pursuing too deeply. Yeah. And I, I wanted to add, too, that this has reached into other fields. Like we were, we were interviewing Steve Grossberg, who's an absolutely brilliant, uh, what is he, a cognitive scientist? He's a theoretical cognitive scientist. He works on consciousness. Mm-hmm. And and right at the beginning of the interview, he was like, yeah, it's amazing how we can universalize laws. And he brought up Kirchhoff's law without realizing it and was <laughs> like, yeah, you know how thermal radiation is independent of the nature of the cavity. And I was like, I couldn't go on. Like, I couldn't <laughs> let that slip by. I was just like, hold, hold, hold on. That, there's no evidence that that's actually true. That's just an assumption. And he was just, he was kind of embarrassed, I think. And I felt bad. And like, it was a terrible way to start the interview. But I was like, geez, we're here to talk about, you know, your theory of consciousness. And he's a brilliant man for sure but he kind of walked into a land a oh, landmine with that right? of consciousness yeah yeah. Uh, yeah but yeah yeah maybe we can talk about That's, uh kirchhoff's law death, a little bit the death of a beautiful theory by an ugly fact who said that uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it's sad though because I, we i want science to be a place where ugly facts make for better theories where you're not uh-huh. threatened like a theory is not threatened you're just like oh, okay maybe i need to look at this a little bit differently Mm-hmm. In my own theoretical work over the years, I've I've really come to embrace the idea that you're only improving your model by integrating this bad data, right? You're you're only making it stronger. Even if you have to add a new set of mechanics into the situation to explain it, you're mm-hmm. you're really moving forward. And I don't know how we've come to the place where something contradicting your theory is a problem. It should be a blessing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's that's one of the big accomplishments also of uh, Pierre Marie. That um, I mean, he was he is someone who is uh, capable of capable of of thinking outside the box. But I mean, doing all that detailed research of history, because when we are talking, and as Anastasia rightly said before today, you're not supposed to think outside your model. You're not supposed to ask that question, but always there was a time where you could do that back in history mm. and uh so it ha- always it, it often happens that if you go back in history there is there is no clarity about is the sun gaseous or is it a liquid i mean people 100 years ago were, were discussing it in all seriousness mm. uh, this. so this is one of the big accomplishments also that he has done this incredible amount of research um demonstrating that these were reasonable thoughts and 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 the and the physicists the solar physicists back then they just ran into into an in an inevitable dilemma because i mean that that um, liquid metallic hydrogen wasn't just it wasn't invented it wasn't thinkable at the time and uh it was it was discovered in 1935. The alternative I'm, I and, and Pierre are going to propose for the for the sun as a model is liquid metallic hydrogen. But at the time it was decided whether the sun is a liquid or a gas, um, that wasn't known. So they ran in this dilemma and decided to take this path and not the other one. And so everything developed on, on, on the basis of the gaseous model and, and somehow they did it. But if you go back to history, you clearly see that that uh, something went wrong a long time ago. And this is and one of the most up is really is really something great. Yeah, it's so, this is one of the most frustrating aspects of interacting with people who are new to the idea is that the most common criticism you'll receive is, oh, do you think that you're smarter than 150 years of physicists? And the answer is obviously, no, none of them know about this. None of them have had the time to go back and review the history. 
By the way, it's worth plugging Pierre's incredible historic synopsis of the composition of the sun. There's a fantastic piece where he's translated, you know, works, uh, primary source references of these authors, because like you mm -hmm. said, it was a very heated debate for for a couple hundred years there. And mm -hmm. it's not like they really solved the debate or, or, or ended it. They just moved on, right? At some point, mm -hmm. especially yeah. when they were trying to figure out how the sun was powered, Eddington came into fame and people just moved on. So, no, I don't think I'm smarter than 150 years worth of physicists. I just think they don't know. Yeah, I mean, I remember people, particle physicists accusing me. Do you think that you were smarter than 10,000 physicists at CERN? So, no, 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 that's not the question. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, but they, they, these people, they don't understand how, how science worked on the long run. And it's not a continuous process. But, I mean, sometimes, inevitably, without bad intentions also, without being stupid. I mean, it's yes. just an unfortunate kind um, coincidence in history. But you run into a dead end. So... <laughs> That's how it how it works. Otto Hahn ran into a dead end. He 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 thought that the you couldn't split up the nucleus. He did five years of research with this crazy idea of trans Iranian trans Iranian elements. Fermi got even the Nobel Prize in 1938 for the wrong stuff. But uh, and then they realized that oh no, we already split the nucleus. But it took them five years to realize. So you inevitably have these uh, dead ends. But the longer you, you have to go back in history, the more difficult it becomes to turn over everything, of course.